Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Scottish Parliament, your Scottish Parliament. Uh, I'm Jackson Carlo, MSP. I am the convener of the Citizens' Participation and Public Petitions Committee here in the Scottish Parliament. I always like to give a plug for this committee because I do think of all the uh, innovations and introductions that we made into the Parliament that was established here in Scotland, our Public Petitions Committee has been one of the most effective and most successful. Uh, and has really brought about some quite profound change in the lives of people in Scotland. One individual, any Scottish person sitting in the room this afternoon, can lodge a petition with the Scottish Parliament. And unlike Westminster, where you've got to get 30,000 signatures before anybody will sneeze at it, we will consider that petition. Uh, and from that, changes to the law have happened. Free personal care for the elderly, the way in which the whole transvaginal mesh scandal has been handled uh, intervention for people with dementia under the age of 50. Lots of changes to social legislation as a result. But it's great to have you here in the, uh, this 2024 Festival of Politics. It's the 20th year of the festival and involves and has brought together people from all ages, all walks of life and uh, all interests as well. And I look forward as we progress to hearing your thoughts and suggestions and contributions. We're very glad to receive them. And we're looking today at the fact that there are elections in 50 countries, it's uh, almost unprecedented, the, the, the overdose of democracy that the, the world is enduring this year, whether it likes it or not, uh, that uh, it's very interesting to understand what will the common trends, threads and outcomes of all of that be. And I'm delighted uh, that we are going to be um, uh, hosting this in partnership with the University of Glasgow. And later I'll be inviting you, as I said, to get involved. And we've got our BSE BSL interpreters Jemina Napier and Andy Carmichael who are working with us today and if you're keen to throw your thoughts in the ring you can do so visit at visit Scott Powell on X or on Instagram at Scottish Parliament and this session is being recorded and will be available uh, whether people want to see it or not on the Scottish Parliament's <laughs> YouTube channel later and I'm delighted we've got a great panel with us uh, Professor Nicola McEwen who's a Professor of Public Policy in the College of Social Sciences and Director of the Centre of Public Policy at the University of Glasgow. Nicola was previously at Edinburgh University as a senior lecturer and as a professor of territorial politics. Uh, she was founding uh, co-director of the Centre on Constitutional Change, where she remains a research fellow. And Nicola is one of those uh, very important people who gives evidence to the committees of this parliament from time to time uh, and helps us come to determinations about issues like international relations, particularly during the whole Brexit and constitutional kind of period. Uh, Mark Diffley uh, is one of those people who you may know the name of, but you read his opinion polls uh, and various other things because he's a researcher and pollster with over 20 years experience. After 10 years as director of Ipsos Mori in Edinburgh, uh, who I thought never got any election poll right. Mark, but <laughs> Only before and after. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but you can correct me in due course. Mark set up a new business in 2017, delivering research and insight for clients across Scotland and further afield. And Jason Box is a partner of RXN Group in Washington, D.C., and has worked in public affairs and opinion research for more than 20 years with an expertise in communications and digital research, reputation, brand management and political strategy. And yet that all sounds terribly impressive. And yet the first thing I asked when I met him was, what do you think of Donald? But we'll get round to that as well. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with, a, with a, just a kind of teasing opening question for you all. Um, when we were talking before, uh, Mark was reflecting that, that something like over 3 billion people are voting this year. You know, I was born in 1959. There weren't 3 billion people alive on the planet there were only 2.9 billion of us. Um, and the explosion of population in the world is quite extraordinary from that 2.9 billion to sort of 8 billion people, souls living in the planet today with 3 billion of them uh, voting. Now, some of those elections have taken place. Some have still to take place. But, you know, what's your mid-year check on how, in fact, the whole uh, explosion of democracy is uh, turning out to be. And will I come to you, Mark, first? Yeah, thanks very much, and thank you. Um, it's, it's, a pleasure to, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so we're about sort of two-thirds of the way through. I mean, obviously, chronologically we are, but there are, also, there are still actually quite a few really interesting elections uh, to come this year, most notably uh, 
the one I'm sure Jason will, 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 will talk about uh, in a bit more detail and with his, uh, with his expertise. But there are several actually in Eastern, uh, around Eastern Europe which are going to have, I think, Moldova, Lithuania, and so on, and the Czech Republic, which may have some quite big impacts on you know, the, the, the situation in, in, in that part of the world, which we're all sort of quite familiar with now. So we're not, we're not kind of through this kind of explosive de- democracy event uh, just yet. I mean, for me, I think the, uh, the 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 thing that we are seeing, to a greater or lesser extent, is the the impact of incumbency at this point. So it appears to be that incumbents are struggling, and I'm sure we'll come on and talk about some of the some of the reasons for that. And even where incumbents have held on, such as in India or, uh, and in South Africa, um, they have suffered uh, quite significant setbacks, and they are in much less powerful positions than they were um, than they were uh, before the election, uh, let alone for all the incumbents who have actually been defeated, uh, not least in, in the UK, of course. So I think that's kind of broadly, I think once the dust settles on this, that's possibly what we're going to look back on and see as the, as the thread maybe that kind of brings it all together. Of course, each of these countries has its own context uh, and, and its own explanations for what's happened um, but I suspect that may be one of the themes that runs through that runs through each of them. Well we're going to have a whole, a whole session on the American election I can tell you that but um, we'll come round to that. Nicola what, what's your view? Yeah I mean it's easy to be cynical about democracy and, and elections and we quite often are right um, when we when we experience them when we vote in them but I do think there is something quite wonderful about this year of elections as well. And I was looking at the, the, the numbers around the, the Indian election. It took a month and a half to conduct. There's 640 million people voted. And that's just phenomenal. And the turnout, it considerably higher yes. than in the UK election. Yes. You know, two-thirds of the electorate voting, more women than ever before. And I think that's Brilliant. I mean, I think we have to be, okay, now that I've done that hope and ray of sunshine thing, um, <laughs> the, the, I mean, not all, not all, elections are not always in democracies, right? So, you know, Putin was re-elected um, and Russia is certainly not a, a, a democracy around it. I think we kind of about 70 or so uh, elections this year and around a third of those are not in democracies, they're in authoritarian regimes and we can maybe talk about the reasons why um, you know they, they may have that too so an election as an event in itself is not sufficient sign of a healthy democracy but it's still quite cool and Jason we'll get to your big election in time no, but I, no, I already gave that I already did that panel. Um, uh, it's great to be here, thank you. And I love, uh, I, this is the first panel I've been on in 11 years where I actually knew all the panelists from doing it previously with them, so it's kind of nice. Uh, apologies if uh, you've been in any of my previous panels because you may hear the same themes. Uh, uh, we'll see. Uh, so I was a, uh, uh, in university, I was an international relations major, and then I have a graduate degree in political science. So, and I've been a political pollster for 20-some years. So this year is just... It's like Christmas and Hanukkah and all the Kwanzaa, <laughs> all just wrapped up into one. Um, and I, and I'm, I agree with Nicola. I, I am uh, incredibly optimistic about the fact that so many people are voting and expressing uh, their, their, you know, their, their, it's the privilege of being in a democracy. Uh, but elections have implications, and, uh, and it's, it's unfortunate timing that so many people are voting immediately in the aftermath of the effects of COVID. Uh, and so Mark was talking about the challenges that incumbents are having. Incumbency is an awesome thing. I'm sure you've experienced that. Uh, it's some, it's something like 90% of uh, their win rates at like 90%. They're struggling this year because uh, the economy has been not great. Uh, at James Carville is a, an American uh, political consultant um, and he's a lot of things, he's funny. Uh, but he had a saying, it's the economy, stupid. And it's true, you can really boil down what, what's going to happen in an election to how people feel about the economy. And in the aftermath of COVID, where countries really stepped up in a lot of admirable ways and, and did what their governments are supposed to do, are now struggling with inflation and the, and the aftermath of COVID and the shutdowns. And it's just really bad timing for them. 
that now all these elections are happening and people are saying, you know what? Thank you for saving us from COVID. Thank you for guiding us through that. What have you done for me lately? Uh, and that is the goldfish mentality of a memory, if you're a Ted Lasso fan. Uh, that is the goldfish memory of the average voter. What, it, what is my life today? And if I'm not happy about it, I'm going to vote against the incumbent. So, yeah, it's a really interesting time to be a political science-like person. Yeah. Well, I'm very pleased to know that we're both Ted Lasso fans. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, um, but I, I was interested in this, this whole issue of, of the pandemic, uh, COVID, because it does seem to me that uh, every government that was in power during the course of the pandemic, whether they were of left or right, whether in New Zealand, Australia, Germany, uh, here, uh, has then lost power in the subsequent election. Um, and there are others that have suffered significant reverses. Uh, Macron suffered terrible reverses in the, uh, the kind of uh, elections to the parliament. Um, and we know that, there, you know that Trudeau is now suffering in, in Canada and looks as if he might be at risk. The Irish government changed as well. I mean, everywhere it seemed to be that although in each of those countries individually... There was no kind of drawing of a national, an international thread of how the pandemic had had an impact. If you look at it on a kind of international basis, irrespective of the political complexion of the government at the time, they all seem to have suffered or lost office subsequently. Now, is that a coincidence or is there something underlying? I mean, you've pointed to the economy and the subsequent effect of that. And was there any way that a government could argue its way forward out of that if that was the case. Uh, Nicola? So I, I think there are, <clears throat> certainly th we have to be careful not to overgeneralise um, and not to assume everything is about COVID and, and the economy. So all of the, the elections will have their own sort of national drivers. You mentioned Justin Trudeau. There's an awful lot of reasons why he's in trouble, uh, not all down to, to, to the economy. Um, but I was re reading some things about the, the key issues in elections and quite a lot of them are the same and quite a lot of them are, are really difficult for any one government to deal with alone. Um, so, you know, immigration, um, the economy, but drawing from global patterns as well. So, yes, COVID really mattered and it was striking the way that governments were in the immediate aftermath or in the midst, they were credited as if there was a kind of, yes, yeah, thanks for that, as you mentioned. Um, and now that seems like quite a long time ago. And actually, COVID recovery is really hard, and particularly when there's all these other factors going on uh, and at play as well. And so I think COVID matters, but because of the uh, knock-on effects of that, plus all the other challenges um, in, in play as well. And it's just really difficult. Um, and there's not a whole lot of sympathy um, for that. Jason? Well, I couldn't agree more. Um, <clears throat> even in the U.S., uh, it's not... It, COVID was an interesting thing because COVID, COVID coincided with this sort of realignment uh, in U.S. politics around issues. Um, but COVID in and of itself is not what is actually causing these various election surprises that we're seeing. It's the, it's the, it's the bank shot, right? Um, so Nicola mentioned immigration, which is inherently, by the way, tied to the economy, which is inherently tied to climate change, uh, particularly in the global south. But in the US, climate change is not an issue, not directly. Um, so we're seeing the sort of the, how complex and uh, interlocked uh, a lot of these issues are. Um, I think in the U.S. at least, I won't speak to other, to other countries, but in the U.S., for me, the big trend is um, we are tired of being tired and tired of being sad and depressed and angry. Um, and Donald Trump has uh, tied into the fear and the anger because that's all his reptilian brain can manage. Um, and the, the response to that is not a policy response. It's almost an attitude. Uh, just a, it's a, a burst of optimism and, um, and joy and happiness. So I'm actually, as somebody who's followed elections for a long time, I would have told you a year ago, don't be stupid. People don't vote on emotion. I mean, it, 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 voting is an emotional thing, but no candidate is going to win 
on a motion, and I have to revise that philosophy because I think this year, at least in the U.S., it's not an election about policy. It's an election about sort of this more fundamental notion of who we are as Americans. And I'm a happy American, uh, and I think maybe more Americans are than not. Interesting. Mark, obviously your organization does deep dive polling and, and has an opportunity to look at the kind of complexity of all these things. Is it an indirect, a direct? What did you feel the, the whole COVID kind of, the, the post-COVID impact on uh, politics has been so and I mean, will I, be in other countries? Yeah. No, no, I mean, I mean I, my, my view is that um, whether you're just looking at the UK or Scotland, the UK or more widely, these, um, these trends are much more deep-rooted and longer uh, and longer term than, than than COVID, right? So you can go back. I mean, for people that are interested in all this, which I assume you are because you're, you're, you're all here today, I mean, look at things like the Pew Centre do, that does a kind of an annual uh, global survey of attitudes to democracy, right? And you see these trends kind of emerging over a really long period of time. And one of the reasons that we that people talk about, you know, the crisis of democracy and so on is because it's almost being eaten from within. You know, voters are... Um, and this is not a UK Scottish phenomenon, this is a global phenomenon in democracies, are increasingly and deeply distrustful of both the institutions and the individuals who who represent them. And this is this is predates COVID by uh, you know a very long a very long time. So you, if if you look now and you see well, uh, oh, that looks like a really surprising result at that election. Well, probably not because. I think if you've been paying attention and looking at the, you know, really good, high-quality data, this has been coming down the track for quite some time. And, of course, they're not helped by individuals, including the one that you just referenced there, who, whose whole shtick is, is, to, is to sort of play on this, right, and to feed into it and to exacerbate it and to play on people's fears. And, you know, you're right to be mistrustful. You're right to question... Well, not to question everything, but, you know, they're out to get you. And, and it's kind of been... It's sort of almost being eaten from um, uh, eaten from within, uh, and that's I think really one of the most uh, sort of worrying things I think that we observe. Did COVID presidentialize even representative democracies, in the sense that because of lockdowns, a figurehead had to emerge and almost almost become presidential in the way that they presented themselves? I mean, here in Scotland. The only face people really saw was Nicola Sturgeon. Mm. In New, Ze New Zealand, it was Jacinda Ardern. It, 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 even where you had traditional uh, representative democracy, and I know over the last 40 years, in any event, there has been more of a leadership focus in representative democracies, whether we like it or we don't. But, but did it exaggerate that? Did it, did it push the idea of you know, the one-person face um, and make that... Is that a long-term trend now firmly established in all democracies? Uh, do, do we now just have to live with the fact that whether you are in a presidential system or a representative democracy, it will feel presidential? I mean, my, my view, so just to, to jump in is, on your first point, is, yeah, I think, that, I think that is true. I mean, just anecdotally, I mean, I, I did a lot, of the, a lot of the focus group work for the SNP before like, they, they commissioned our organisation to do it, before um, the 2021 um, Holyrood election, right? And so night after night, I was going on and on Zoom because you, you you weren't able to kind of meet in person at that point, and talking to voters who were saying, "Well, you know, I probably won't vote SNP. I would definitely not in favour of kind of constitutional change, but she's doing a you know she's doing an amazing job, right?" And it was all that it, that it was all about her, right? Because she was coming on, she was on our TV screens every day for an hour or or whatever, and yeah. You know, again, much more locally, but um, Andy Burnham, the mayor of Manchester, was here at the book festival this year, and I, I was lucky enough to go along to his event. And he talks about how COVID really empowered his role because he was the kind of face of the, the, the North West and his region, and he was battling for all the money when they were distributing the funds to keep businesses afloat and all that, and fighting for more, a bit more cash from the Treasury and so on. And he, you know, he openly said, you know, that period really kind of empowered him, and the subsequent election, his vote went, you know, kind it's of through the individual. You can reap what you sow as well, no, uh, no, Nicola. No. So, uh, I was just thinking that exactly because, I mean, in the case of a public health emergency, um, that could work very well when people trust the messenger, 
if they don't trust the messenger, then that could backfire <laughs> spectacularly. And it's interesting that despite, you know, again, talking about that particular period, despite, forgive me, the enormous ego of the Prime Minister at the time um, and, and, and Boris Johnson, he didn't really do that. He did have the public communications, but always flanked by um, scientists and giving them more of a voice. So it wasn't quite the same and maybe didn't reap the same um, benefits as a result of that. But it does um, potentially expose you and, and leave you vulnerable when the tides turn. And I was thinking actually of Emmanuel Macron um, in a similar situation where such a big personality has put himself forward in that way and is very polarising. And Nicola Sturgeon, towards the end of her tenure, became very polarising. Um, so I think you're right to observe that as a trend, um, but it does rather expose uh, the people in those positions, and I expect it's not particularly pleasant. But it was interesting because, funnily enough, I, um, I had a conversation with uh, Boris because I was party leader up here at the time when the uh, pandemic began. And I said to him that um, he should watch Nicola Sturgeon carefully because she had gained a lot of experience during the bird flu pandemic. Uh, previously and had learned the value of single person communication and it did strike me that uh, actually at a UK level they didn't do that they had a they had a revolving carousel of faces between Matt Hancock one day and the, whoever the Home Secretary was the next um, and uh, gosh I've even forgotten who they were <laughs> but, uh, but, but uh, and in consequence what constituents said to me is they found that more fragmented and disjointed than the single communication. But the difficulty, and I think this is maybe what you're alluding to, is to recognise that there is a season, and when that season ends, you can't just carry on like that in respect of every other aspect of political life too. And I think that maybe is what some, something of what we saw in more than one country, and that became quite dangerous. Jason? I was just thinking it must have been so nice to have had a leader who took charge and uh, <laughs> was the positive face to a, to a cure. You're, I, I, so it's interesting. The, the question was, did COVID presidentialize places that maybe were not so? And I do think that global problems or universal problems require universal solutions so that there's this opportunity to step up and maybe fill a role uh, that hadn't previously existed. I, I think the effect that maybe you were talking about a little bit, Nicola, in the UK, we, I think it had the opposite impact in the United States. I think we became immediately polarized, even more so than we had previously been. Uh, and we had all of these sort of competing views and there was no one person who could actually stand up and say, I represent all of your best interests. That was the, the garage door that Joe Biden drove through uh, because he offered, not for everyone, but for certainly a majority, that kind of presidentialized, I'm a, I'm a, I, I am selfless, I am a committed patriot and civil servant, and I am a safe vote. Um, and we're seeing that again in this election. Yeah. Okay, I mean, you alluded to this in the opening section, and that is that you can have elections, but are they genuinely free and fair and uh, properly representative for the electorate who are able to participate in them and quite a few of the countries that are voting this year you might put into the category of saying perhaps not and I therefore wonder what you think in, a, in these different contexts the act of an election does actually represent is it is it still an opportunity for people to to make a point, even if they can't express it in quite the same way? Or is it a fear that if they're not seen to vote, well, that could cause them some sort of personal difficulty because these things are recorded? And, you know, I mean, in Australia, for example, which is a democracy, it's a criminal offence not to vote. So, um, so I'm wondering, what is your view about the, the myriad of countries that one might not immediately think of as natural democracies who are nonetheless having elections and, and what that means in the context of the, the, the three and a half billion or whoever it is that are voting this year. Who would like to... I'm going to ask for a volunteer this time. To, <laughs> who would like to go for that one? Not you, Jason. All right, well, Nicola. I'll offer a couple of things. I mean, I think 
what is the purpose of an election in that sort of scenario? And I think it, they are performative in a sense. And they do give a platform to the leader of the, of the day um, who is not facing any opposition. And it, it sort of attaches legitimacy to the regime um, that is a different kind of legitimacy from the, the, the accountable one uh, that, that we are uh, used to and, and lucky to experience here. Um, but a lot of authoritarian regimes have elections uh, for that reason. Um, and you know what is it that makes them not democratic? And often they have quite high turnout. I can't speak to whether that high turnout is because people people feel compelled or because they want to participate. That I don't have the answer to that. Um, but I think they still do serve a purpose in that in that kind of system. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think legitimacy is the kind of key word here, and it may be sort of internal legitimacy within yeah. their country. Yeah. Um, we're all sort of, and we're all sort of, yeah, yeah we're all sort of staring well. from outside, yeah. saying, yeah. You know, "Well, this is an absolute joke." But um, you know, internally, the, the the story is very different. So, I mean, I, I think here there's some really instructive stuff, right? Because as well as um, as well as you know what I was talking about earlier about kind of global studies around perceptions of democracy. There are also kind of think tanks and institutes that rate countries, right? So they give them a score. So you look at things like rates of participation, they look at the kind of rule of law, they look at voting systems and so on, and they come to a kind of an expert view of, um, you, you, um, of how democratic this, uh, this country is, right? And if you, look at the, if you look at the rankings or you look at the, the ratings for each individual country, it kind of makes some sense, right? If I gave you sort of 30 countries, you could probably do a, you know, anyone in this room could do a pretty good job of putting them in some kind of reasonable order of, uh, of what an expert would consider to be good democracy or bad democracy, right? But the interesting thing is there's a real disjoin between what experts, how, how democratic an expert thinks uh, that country is to what the citizens of that country think about the democracy of that country, right? So India is a kind of key, uh, is, you know, I think it's about, in the Pew study, I think there's about 70% of people in India rate the democracy of India very highly. But if you ask an expert, I think it gets like 0 .3, 0 0.3 on a 0 to 1 scale. In you know, so an expert would look at India and go, it's really not, dem not democratic at all, certainly not by kind of Western or European standards or whatever. But actually people in that country think it's pretty democratic, either for cultural reasons or historical reasons compared to what they that we used to in the past. So the legitimacy thing is really important, right? If that's your audience, absolutely fine. And who cares about the people outside who are kind of sneering at you and, and, and you know, criticising the way, the way you do things. People in here, people in the country are actually quite, are quite satisfied. And you see that a lot. You see kind of um, this disjoint between expert views and citizens' views. And I, I think that's one of the, the most interesting things, actually, kind of looking at at global democracy. Yeah. You said not me. <laughs> have you reflected further? <laughs> oh, I have. Uh, I have index cards full of responses for you. Um, no, I, 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 it is an interesting idea that democracy is performative. I, why else would President Putin have a, an election in the first place? Right. I think. I think there's a certain acceptability that comes with going through the measures. Where I get worried is uh, in places where it is naturally assumed that it's a successful democracy, and yet the citizens, forget about the self-rating, the citizens themselves are not uh, who you would expect to be a part of a vibrant democracy, the, sort of the collapse of civil society, and the, the lack of an understanding of how you fit into, uh, into a, the sort of the civics of a country and what is a proper way of responding to things that you don't like. This is all the, the stuff of civics. And um, I, I'm, I'm certain we're the worst, uh, certainly relative to Scotland, but uh, Americans miserably fail civics tests, uh, like 30% uh, uh, roughly. Uh, and I don't entirely blame them. I think we've kind of shifted away from teaching it. But this idea of democracy as a value positive as opposed to a value neutral, um, it, it begins to look a little shaky when the countries don't actually give value to making sure that the citizens understand and appreciate what their role is in a democracy. And I think that has all kinds of implications. 
Can I just ask about the, the relative impact of turnout? Because we, we, we've talked about all the people who are eligible to vote and who will then vote. And I always, as a teenager, used to be hugely amused when uh, the Politburo elections in the Soviet Union would tell us <laughs> that 96% of people had uh, voted. Until the Scottish independence referendum <laughs> when something like 92% of my constituents in uh, Eastwood, which is on the south side of Glasgow, uh, turned out to vote in that referendum. And in fact, the Scottish independence referendum achieved the highest turnout of any democratic exercise ever held at any time in the history of the United Kingdom. I mean, it was quite extraordinary. And yet we've just had a general election where we've had the lowest, second lowest turnout since 1885, uh, it, so, yeah, it was, uh, and elected a government with a massive majority uh, on the lowest share of the vote and, the, as I say, the second lowest turnout in the last sort of 150 years. And, and you ask, a profound change can therefore happen to a country irrespective of whether the turnout is 92%, although it's very difficult to argue after the event when 92% of people have voted that, you know, that wasn't representative of what the people thought, as certain people have found. Or you can, but with, with, with a much lower turnout, but still such profound change. And is that a theme in other countries too? I mean, why, why is turnout so variable in an election? Mark, I suppose you so, do a lot of the polling of this. So what are the factors that um, determine turnout they are uh, well, the, the, the voting system and what you're voting for. I mean, one. Of, I mean, we we, we did uh, quite a lot of quite a lot of work around uh, around turnout and around participation during during the 2014 and the lead up to the referendum. And what was clear when I was talking to people who had never voted before, actually of, of, of all ages, who had it, who were intending to vote and clearly who did in huge numbers vote in 2014, was one that. Every vote was equal, right? It was a kind of national referendum, so it didn't matter where you were. There was no, you know, if you lived in, you know, in a general election or in a in a Holyrood election, you know, depending on the constituency you live in, your vote might be almost worthless in terms of what it will count to uh, uh, to the to the decisiveness of the result. Um, and it felt like a really important issue. I mean, it was kind of fundamental to the, you know. People would say, you oh, know, governments kind of come and go and whatever, but actually this is this is really important. So the importance of the event, uh, the weight of the vote, I think, really counts. I think th the reason that people um, like me, probably Nicola, other kind of pollsters were saying that the, you know, predicting in advance of this year's election that turnout would be low is because uh, it felt like a foregone conclusion. So... Uh, it turned out Labour wasn't 20 po points uh, uh, ahead, but, you know, the polling showed Labour miles ahead. That's a disincentive for a lot of people to turn out. Uh, the two leaders, OK, it wasn't the presidential election, but the two leaders who were kind of front and centre of the campaign were not, how should we put this kindly, the most kind of energetic or kind of engaging uh, individuals that we've ever had kind of representing us, for good or bad. Um, so that didn't kind of spark people into life. So all these, all these factors kind of play into... Uh, play into um, the extent to which people turn out or not. I mean, it's always been said in the past, just finally, that the biggest indicator of voting is whether you've voted before. So once you do it once, you kind of, it becomes sort of habitual. Now, clearly, that's not entirely true, right? I think it was true for, for, for some time, but clearly it's not, because, you know, from 85% in a referendum to barely 60% uh, 10 years later in an election... Um, is, is clearly quite a worrying, uh, quite a worrying trend. Um, but yeah, these these are the reasons why people tend to turn out or not. Jason, I think there's one other element uh, because there's the intent or the interest in, in voting, and then there's the actual practice of doing it. Um, I'm not familiar with how it works here, but uh, there are a lot of obstacles uh, in the United States to actually be able to vote. Uh, and then a question of whether or not your vote will actually see the light of day. And so this, there's a real danger. Um, and it's most obvious in the United States, but it is certainly not uh, limited to the United States, questioning the veracity or validity of uh, a vote before it even happens. So not only 
the the ease or difficulty that it takes to vote, but then the belief that your vote will actually be counted. What's the incentive to vote if you think that it's already been decided that it's and, tr and Trump has been saying this. I should start saying Voldemort. It just because I don't really like saying his name. Um, um, he he's been saying since day one. Uh, I if if I don't win in a landslide, it's because the Democrats cheated. And what do you do with that? And, and, as a, and as a pollster and somebody who advises not so much political candidates, but people who are politically adjacent, how do you plan for what happens next? Well, when you know that the day after the election, there are best case scenario, it's a couple dozen lawsuits. Worst case scenario, it's another January 6th, uh, which I cannot rule out. So I, I think turnout, it's also a belief that the system works. Uh, and that your 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 vote will matter, but but what is the turnout? It's been quite low in, in oh, presidential. Six is a great day in the office for the U.S. Are you kidding me? Like, uh, 2020 was billed as the most important election of our lifetime, 66 percent turnout. Yeah, which is quite something, Nicola. I mean, you, you're a public policy and uh, advisor, and this is obviously, I mean, is it something people get overly concerned about, and it'll switch around or is no, it a real concern? I, I, th I, I think it is a real concern and I agree with everything that, that Mark said but the, the last time that we had a turnout as low as the one we've just had was in 2001 and there you were dealing with Blair's second term, it was a shoe in so yes it was predictable, this was different, yes the polls had Labour friends but it was a change election and it, it worries me a bit that that wasn't I mean, they didn't really give people, other than change, we didn't really know what it was about because there wasn't much in the way of substance in, in the election campaign itself. And contrast that with the, the independence referendum where there was that historically high turnout. It was an issue that was important to people wherever you fell on that spectrum of, of, of opinions. And there just wasn't the same enthusiasm in 2009. So, so yes, when it's close, when it's predictable, when it's boring, when it's in the summer, when frankly there's an awful lot of other things going on. Um, you, what we've lost, I think, is, um, and this is generational, that sense of duty, the civic duty to vote. So if people don't have that, if they're not growing up with that sense of duty to vote, you have to give them something else. It has to be meaningful. Um, and, and that is influenced by the system. It's influenced by, you know, the ability of, your, of, of you to make a difference to the outcome, whether that's locally or nationally. Um, and I, I, I'm a little bit worried about um, the, the turnout figures that we just had in the UK election. So this may not be the natural swing, but there could be an intergenerational change of attitude to whether or not it's worthwhile voting. So what, if anything, would you suggest... I mean, is this something for politicians to try and do something about, or are they actually the, the reason why that is the case? So I've always, I, I used to say this to students, you know, obviously students of politics were more inclined to be voting students than, than not anyway, but my concern was always if, if, if young people don't participate in the electoral process, then um, political parties may turn attention to those whose votes they are competing for. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a kind of, and, and then that's the sort of self-perpetuating thing because then politics becomes about these issues that you're not as engaged in. Um, you see what I mean? So it's quite cyclical in that sense. I mean, I found it was interesting as a politician during the Scottish independence referendum, one of the most engaged communities was uh, the youth Absolutely. community. I mean, Absolutely. I found the quality of analysis and debate that I came across in schools when I visited uh, almost better than anywhere else. Uh, and that was really, really interesting. And I tried to analyse that myself. And you're right. I, I kind of thought, well, it is a single issue. Are you right or wrong? And it occurred to me then, has the idea of subscribing to a basket of policy issues under the umbrella of a single political party become less of an appealing prospect because people have different views about everything and therefore can, can find themselves more easily motivated by a single choice issue than they can by supporting a party who then do something that they don't like and they get very upset about it. 
do you think there is something in that? Absolutely. And, and quite often, you know, I get enormously frustrated with people saying, well, I don't really like any of them. Or I don't really agree with it. You know, you're never going to agree with everything in a political party, but it's very difficult to have a functioning, effective democracy without political parties. But I do think that parties and politicians and parliamentarians, and I know that you do this, uh, Jackson, need to find other ways to engage um, young people in between elections and actually governments. Really, there are really difficult issues facing governments. Don't you keep them to yourself. You know, engage people, engage them in that process and inform and, and deliberate and, and allow and empower people to be part of that decision making process. And I think when you, you know, if there is a feeling that it's every five years or so you're asked for your opinion, well, you know, why are we surprised that there is dissatisfaction with that? Yeah. I, I completely agree with that. And Nicola, I, Nicola and I were both heavily involved in the Citizens' Assembly five five years ago, four years ago. God, is that that long ago? It was like a lifetime ago. <laughs> and of course, there was supposed to, there was, you know, this was going to be the brave new world of kind of participative democracy and so on. And for, for, for many reasons, some of which are I, I have sympathy with, not least they cost a lot to, to, to run and put on. Um, you know, in these kind of straightened times, you know, you, that, that's the sort of thing that goes, unfortunately. Um, but they are brilliant, and uh, citizens um, love them. And you, you, you know, those who are kind of lucky enough to be chosen to take part. I actually think these the, these are some of the, these are some of the kind of solutions um, um, to the, the inverted commas crisis that we're seeing. It is about more engagement and more meaningful engagement. And I completely agree. You, you only have to look at the the tone and the debate around the election that we've just been through. It, you know, young people's voice in this was almost. Entirely absent. It is interesting. I mean, I, my committee has held an inquiry into uh, public participation. Um, and it's been fascinating because it's different. I mean, we visited Ireland. And in Ireland, they have a fantastic kind of uh, citizens' assembly. Uh, they call it Ire uh, Ireland in one room uh, because they believe it's much more representative than a parliament. But it also has a kind of constitutional circle in that the issues that the uh, citizens' parliaments, uh, par par the, the citizens' uh, assemblies in Ireland discuss, are voted for within the context of the manifesto in the election. Um, they then go to the, uh, the, 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 the citizens' assembly, they come back to the parliament, who then look at it, and it then goes to a national referendum in the event that it is something constitutional, like abortion was, for example. Um, in Paris, it was quite different, that they had just initiated their process brought together 100 people and asked them what they'd like to talk about. Um, and, of course, that wasn't a very healthy start because they then said, well, we don't really know what should we talk about. So what the local administration then did was tell them what to talk about, <laughs> but then were able to use, without a manifesto or an election underpinning that uh, commitment, they were able to use that panel to bring forward policies nobody had actually voted for. Um, and it was slightly more cynical, I felt, uh, in Brussels, the, not the European Union, but the, the country, they'd brought citizen participation in to work in their committee process. So they will have panels of about 60 with 15 politicians and maybe 45 uh, lay people who have an experience of the issue. And they all got together in the room and the, 45, the 15 elected politicians looked at the 45 and said, well, why should we listen to you? Nobody's voted for you. And the 45 said, well, why should we listen to you? You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and progress <laughs> progressively, <laughs> though, they found, teenagers. <laughs> they found kind of common ground. And the work of those uh, partnership committees then informed the parliamentary process and produced better legislation as a result. So you're right, Mark, it's an extra cost. And if done not well... It's an unjustifiable extra cost, but if done correctly, it can be can be the right cost. I have a contrarian point of view on this. Um, it's not so much contrarian. I, I, I think the system itself has to be considered uh, when you talk about turnout and whether high turnout is actually the intent by design. So uh, I'll go back to the U.S. because, sorry. Um, our entire system of government, from the way we elect our officials to the way in which they govern, was designed to be slow and unresponsive. A hundred percent. The Senate was actually created to keep the House in check. And our elections are not really designed to be uh, quick and responsive. 
uh, there's a reason why youth don't vote in the United States. And I, I'm, I'm sort of like uh, Lucy and, and Charlie Brown with the football, and I keep going to kick the football, and I keep missing because Lucy pulls it. Every cycle, I get very excited about youth turnout. This is the year, and I'm just always disappointed. And I stopped blaming young people for not turning out because the system in which they exist is not really designed to be fast and responsive. We're not a, it's not a change kind of electoral system, which, by the way, might not be the worst thing. I, 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 you know, democracy, democracy for democracy's sake, we have a pretty stable government. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I suppose the other point here is, I mean, I, in my profession, we don't do things like we used to 30 years ago. Right. We don't have people with clipboards standing on street corners, like asking people their opinions. It's done online almost entirely. You know, perhaps vote, you know, perhaps voting needs to be more um, accessible. You know, we're still largely doing things. Mm -hmm. We're expecting young people to participate in ways which in other parts of their lives are totally anathema and we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't expect them to take part in those ways. So why, why should we do that with, with, with voting? You know? Interesting. Well, you were talking about America and we're going, I'm just about to open this up to questions in a second, but there's one election we've not talked about and that's the one that's still to take place. Uh, and Poland. W in, w <laughs> in the United States. Um, and of course, it is interesting because the international community imagines that everybody in America is voting with, the, with an eye to the international community, <laughs> whereas everybody in America is actually voting about what matters to them in, in America. But what is important to the, the wider world, who therefore sometimes think, well, it's obviously clear, because, I mean, you know, world peace and this, that, and the next thing depends on it. Um, but what do you think the, the, the immediate differences are going to be in respect of um, the way in which the United States engages with the world dependent upon the outcome of whether it's Kamala Harris or, or Donald it's Trump. Dramatically different. I, I have to tell you, it's very funny. So I've been coming to the festival since 2013, I think it was that. Uh, I was on one panel. It was to discuss Americans' views on Scottish independence. So it was a 90-minute panel. So, uh, I sh so I shared that, and then for the remaining 85 minutes, we just had to make stuff up. Um, it's American elections are generally not determined by foreign policy. Um, the last time it happened was probably 2004, uh, when George Bush ran basically on his, on his war record. Um, I, foreign policy really is an issue in American politics if, if you've either started or ended a war. Otherwise, we don't tend to think about it, but we, that, that doesn't mean we don't care passionately about it. Um, and the difference between the two candidates and really the two parties, because the Republican Party has changed. The Republican Party used to be a globalist party, and it is now a very inward-looking party. That's part of the realignment. Of all the differences between the parties, foreign policy might be the most stark. Uh, it is you are either pro-NATO and pro-involvement and pro-Ukraine and... Uh, pro climate change and pro uh, renewable energy, or you're not like the literally the other side of the list. So it's 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 dramatic. And if I were a, a leader in the UK or, or Scotland, you know, I, I you, you have to scenario plan for the worst case scenario because it's a co it's a coin flip. But if there is a non dictator world leader who isn't quietly praying to whatever their deity is that Kamala wins, they're, they're, they are actually a dictator. Because, because that, that, is the, that is the difference between these two candidates on foreign policy. Are there a rest that you, you get a, an insight on that? Or, or was that one for Jason? Well, I mean, I think... Um, he, 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 what are you calling him? Voldemort? Uh, Voldemort. Trump or whatever you want to call him. Um, he, he is actually making quite a... Ver well, OK, to the extent to which it's true or not, you know, of I will solve... Like kind of global wars, I will, you know, oh, when, I, when, when I was president, the world was much uh, a, a much safer place than it is now. Right. We weren't fighting with China because we were <laughs> friends. Putin and I were friends. <laughs> so no, so I don't. No, I, I mean, I. Oh, Kim, well, that's a love affair. That's different. <laughs> there were love letters involved with Kim Jong. So no, I, I suspect foreign policy won't play a, a huge role, but he does try and at least project himself. Well, fairly or not, or accurately or not, onto the onto yeah. the world stage. Yeah. 
So, I mean, it, it, it is striking. The, I mean, it's, the US is not the only country where the outcome of the election will have repercussions beyond the borders. Yeah. But the extent to which that is the case in the US mm -hmm. um, and, and the contrast with the, yeah. the sense that that doesn't really matter a feature um, is it, just really, really fascinating to me. And, and there's a couple of other things that, that fascinate me about US elections. Um, and we are, and you know that we are just a bit more hopeful now right. than, than a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. um, but one is the Electoral College. This comes up all the time. Um, because it isn't necessarily the case that if you win the popular vote that you will win enough votes within the Electoral College to become president. That was you know, Hillary Clinton's downfall. Um, and I, 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 I'd be interested to know what you think of that, Jason, because I, um, I'm not saying I would defend the Electoral College because I don't really know enough about it. It's not my history, but... I do defend the need to modify the popular vote in a country, in a, fed, in a federal country that has such massive disparities in the size of the states. Because if you didn't have that, if you didn't have some way to modify the influence of California, then you'd probably have, then it'd probably be a more interesting place for me to study from a territorial politics perspective than it currently, than it currently is, because you'd have those dynamics, I think. Um, that, but the other, the other thing is... Yeah, sorry. In the Bundesrat in Germany as well, between the different Lander, where you've got uh, Bavaria, which is about a 17 million population, but it still only has six seats. Uh, and you've got, uh, <coughs> is it Westphalia, with like 600,000 yes. uh, population, with the, the same number of seats. And it's a feature of any federation, and it's just it's part of the deal. It, it's part of the deal. If you want to stay together, you have to recognise and accommodate the diversity institutionally. Um, and it's one of, one of the, the, the ways in which the UK is not a federation, um, in, in the other ways too, but in, in, in that sense. The other contrasting thing that strikes me, and we've, in a lot of the elections we've, we've looked at, and certainly saw it in the UK and France, in the European Parliament elections, which we haven't talked about yet, um, where you, you see a drift away from the more established parties, there was that dissatisfaction being channeled into parties like Reform UK or the left coalition in France, and we're not seeing that in the US. Why is that the case? Because those are very highly responsive actions. Are, are, I, I can't stress enough how, uh, how uh, intentional our, our system is to, to slow things down. <laughs> uh, we tend to look to government to defend and protect, and we tend to look to business to kind of push everything forward. Um, there's no, I constantly have to disabuse people uh, of this idea of like following the national polls because we don't have a national election. Yeah. It's not a popular vote. It's uh, really seven states. And really, 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 it's one state, <laughs> Pennsylvania. Now, how messed up a system is that? That one state determines who's the leader of the free world. Um, but it is designed explicitly to be slow and non-responsive, slow and steady. And maybe that's like an old white guy thing, like they just wanted slow and steady. I, I think it's, we jokingly talk about the fact that the founding fathers actually were scared of the masses. And they felt the need, like you talk performative, like the House of Representatives, it, it's not performative per se because they have the power of the, of the budget, uh, of the purse, but then they installed a Supreme Court who could tell them that what they just did is wrong, fix that. And they, and they installed a Senate uh, to say, no, 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 you've got to pass our body too. And that's the, the thing with the equal seating. Montana and New York have the same representation. You can fit Montana inside one building in, the, in a New York City block. Uh, and then a president who can just ignore the House of Representatives. And I, I, and I don't even have to sign a veto. I can just let the bill die on my desk. I'm going to go play a round of golf, and when I come back, this thing will be invalid, and you can go back to, this, to square one. It's remarkable. It really is. I mean, it's non-responsive. Well, it's something, certainly. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> I hope you've all been thinking up. Uh, you're thinking up quite... form it. I yeah, well, so I, well, I wasn't blaming you personally, but uh, it's a work of art. Do we have um, uh, some questions? We've got a microphone, so we've got a, a lady at the back and a lady at the front. And uh, a lady, we'll get through there. And, uh, and it's see the arm of that said to Well, we'll start with the lady at the back. So if you, if you tell us who you are and then fire out your question. My name is Anne Packard. This is a question, Chairman, for Nicola, if I may. <clears throat> of the nations of the world going to poll this year, 
how many of them have an obligation to vote and should it become obligatory in the United Kingdom? Um, that's an excellent question and to which I do not know the answer off the top of my head. Um, so you're talking about pop compulsory voting. Um, do you know, Mark? Not very many. Not many, no. So, I mean, the, Australia has it, Belgium has it, and, and I don't think neither of them are. Italy? Right, okay. So I suppose it is your, is your question hinting at the desirability of that? Should they? Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't, it's not something that I would advocate, um, compulsory voting. I don't think, um, I, I, I think it's incumbent on those within the democratic system to um, incentivise participation, not to have legal consequences for the absence of that participation if you choose not to. Um, and yeah. sadly, I think we all know what would happen in this country anyway. Uh, people don't like to be told they've got to do something like that. So they wouldn't do it. And then, then, then there would be 50 million spent by local authorities trying to find out who hadn't voted. And that would then lead to the, Scottish, the, the UK government holding a national inquiry into why this all hadn't worked. That would be another £150 million. You're giving Mark ideas. Yeah, at the, at the, at the, end, of, at the, end, at the end of which, at the next election, the party that uh, put in their manifesto that they would abolish the compulsory voting would, would probably then win. So it would be a completely futile exercise, probably, uh, here, because we don't like to be told what to do. Uh, this lady down at the front here, we have one at the front. Hello, I'm Hannah. Um, I wanted to ask about elections happening in Europe this year and what the potential implications are, not just within the nations that are holding them, but for the dynamics and the political cultures within Europe, which is an interesting place at the moment, perhaps including reflections on narratives around the far right in Europe, if you want to. Thank you. Mark? Uh, well, I, no, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, obviously, there have been um, the, the EU election itself to the EU Parliament, um, which, it, 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 to me, it sort of depends where your expectations were. I, I think everyone expected a far kind of greater movement to the right than actually uh, we got. We got some, but we didn't get, get it to the extent that I think a lot of people were anticipating. Um, and then clearly we've had lots of elections in individual countries. The UK, um, France had a sort of surprise election in other, uh, in other countries as well. And there, as I was saying at the beginning, there are still quite a few to come, actually. There's Austria, there's Czech Republic, there's, there's, there's others. Um, you know, there was what some of the big ones being the UK, which we're all kind of familiar with. I, I, thought, I think actually Portugal was one of the most interesting elections this year. Um, Chega, is that what they're called? The, the far right party did make gains but a lot of people thought they were actually going to to, to break through uh, and either win that election or form part of the coalition and they didn't I, I, I think that it hasn't quite been the sort of far right explosion if that's the right word that a lot of us thought it might be at the beginning of the year which sounds kind of dreadfully complacent and it, 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 it's not meant to be at all um, but I think there's been a little bit, overall, there's maybe been a bit of a reverse. It's, I think it's still very worrying what's going on. Um, but I don't think it's happened, in, in my view, to the, to the extent that we, a lot of us thought it might do when, when we set out at the beginning of this year. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, um, on the European Parliament election, I think part of the issue there, I mean, there were gains for the, for yeah. the, the, the far right, however you define that, but they were very fragmented across yeah. different party groups, which, which diminished the effect. Um, I think national elections are a bit different. We were, um, Marine Le Pen's party won the first round, round um, and then really diminished in, in, the, in the round that mattered, right? And, uh, and maybe, maybe it's that part, other parties are getting a bit better at competing against yeah. um, that. And, and clearly in that case, the system helped um, when you when you get a second round uh, to help with that, but it goes back to the earlier point about um, outcomes of elections mattering beyond the, the boundaries of, of the nation state in question, and if in, in 
in the European elections to come, if we do start to see a shift to the right, however far down that spectrum you go, and that's often manifest in the European case with Euroscepticism, right, and a, a hostility to the project of European integration, then that obviously, in the context of the Council of Ministers, could have an impact on the direction of travel of the European Union. Um, and, you know, that UK is not a member uh, state anymore, but it's still heavily influenced by decisions that are made at that level. And the relationship with the EU is still something that's being worked out by the new administration. So that matters. All of that matters to the direction of travel uh, that the EU takes. But, but the experience in France is quite, it was quite interesting because I don't think people expected that second round to be quite as decisive as it turned out to be. But it didn't really help Macron in the end because Mellencamp then kind of saw that as a victory for, yeah. for completely the opposite side of the populist coin and is now you know, it, it creating kind of its own difficult mayhem for the state of France. So it, it, populism has become an, a greater kind of characteristic of elections um, and it's the demagogues of the right that have tended to be the ones that have looked the most sinister. I mean, and some of them do look pretty odd. Um, is it a passing trend? Or, as Mark said, is it something you can't afford to be complacent about? I definitely don't think you can afford to be complacent about it. And I, I, I match the poster, I'm not, so I don't do predictions um, beyond next week. So I wouldn't be able to tell I definitely wouldn't expect it to be a, a passing trend. Um, um, and I, but what, what is interesting, I suppose, is, is what happens when populists get into power. Because in the opposition, it's a pretty easy case to make, right? Because populism is very, it's very black and white. Uh, it doesn't deal with the complexity of public policy challenges, but you can get away with that if you actually do get into government. Um, we saw, I think we've seen a little bit of that in, in, in Italy. Um, so uh, success can in itself bring new challenges that change the nature of these, these movements and parties when they get into government. I suppose, therefore, we, we would characterise Trump in this kind of populist flavour. Mm -hmm. Let, let's, for the moment, just su 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 uh, hypothesise that he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't win. Can we just stop right there? <laughs> <laughs> what then happens to the leadership of the Republican Party post that? Will it, will it find something more balanced again in terms of its leadership? Or are we going to find that we have many populists who aren't quite as good at it? Or are we going to find, in fact, we have people who are even better at it? Because Trump's populism is a sort of mad populism at times, yeah. um, not a reasoned populism. And I sometimes wonder if that is the direction of a certain trend in the United States, might somebody who harnesses all that in a much more rational way be more effective? And is that what the next... Republican leader is likely to be? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so a lot of people want to think that Trump is the sort of cause, uh, but really this trend toward populism was happening before Trump came to office. And in many ways, Trump was just the convenient idiot at the time. Um, and he has tried to shape the party in his name, but the reality is that he is so transactional. He doesn't really, he has a, an incredibly fluid philosophy that just reflects the reality of where the party is now. The party is realigning, and Trump, when Trump is done, uh, there will be a battle for, not for the soul of the party, but for the crown of the newly realigned party. Uh, I used to say that the Republican Party was broken. I was wrong. It was just realigning. Uh, it's a very inward-looking, populist, um, uh, more traditional reflection back on better days, uh, the people who have left the Republican Party, the Never Trumpers, are not going back. So they're going to have to figure out a way. They're going to be in the desert, I think, for a long time. I, I think whether, whether or not Trump wins this election, the next election, um, he, if Trump wins, he does, he, carries it, he does it on the strength of his personality. Uh, and if he loses, he does it on the strength of his personality. <laughs> but when he is gone... The, what will remain is this populist, uh, inward-looking, quasi-neoconservative group, and there will be this 
10 or 15 or maybe even 20 percent of the rest of the what the remnants, the, the, the um, smoldering remnants of the Republican Party of the 1980s and 90s, who will need to find a new home. And it's a tremendous opportunity for the Democratic Party to also realign, but to do it uh, in a more controlled and thoughtful way and to reclaim back some of that middle ground. And I am an unapologetic centrist. And I think that's the, the next political landscape in the U.S. This lady, no, I'm going to go to this lady here. There was the lady, and then there's a gentleman will be next behind. Hi, uh, my name is Stephanie. I come from Taiwan. And um, so just to, a quick comment before my question, but um, I, I just wanted to remark, um, ha having been in Taiwan during the entire pandemic and being here now, I started to realize after getting here what a parallel universe I was living in at the time. And also in terms of um, elections, I think it is quite a, Taiwan presents quite a unique example in that um, the part, basically the two major parties that we vote for, um, it's less about policy than their attitude towards China. Um, so I just wanted to ask the, the panel um, how familiar you are with that how, um, and your thoughts, takes on um, our election, which happened in January. and perhaps what happened in May with the Taiwanese parliament? I mean, I did, Mark? The, the election itself, which was January, it was one of the first this year, wasn't it? It was on the January, February, was it? It was in January. January, yeah. <coughs> I mean, the incumbent won, right? So, but it falls into that kind of one, but kind of weakened. Um, so, um, yeah, they lost the, the parliamentary majority, but he's still, By yeah. So it's kind of created this rather probably quite fragile um, fragile outcome, um, w which, of course, as I was saying at the beginning, kind of falls, you know, th this is part of the, the trend, um, part of the trend of what we're seeing. I don't think for what it's worth, in the story, I don't think we look at this enough um, here. Um, it, the, that election got pretty much zero coverage that I can really recall, certainly in kind of mainstream you know, uh, on mainstream kind of broadcast news or in, or, or in newspapers. Um, we're totally, we've been fixated all year with, with, with our own election and as soon as that's over with, uh, with, with Jason's election. So, um, but it felt to me like it didn't really resolve, it, it, well, would it ever have resolved the issue, I suppose, but it, I suppose it, from where I sit and looking at it, uh, it, 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 it feels like it's still a very uh, delicate and fragile situation. Um, and one which I suspect will be influenced by the outcome of the of the American election as well. I mean, in, in some senses, that might be even more important than the, the outcome of your, the outcome of your own election to some extent, um, at least. And, and and who wins that, particularly given Trump's kind of tendency to tell the world that he can solve every war that's going on, uh, you know, within a couple of hours or whatever. So, um, and a couple of phone calls. So, yeah, that's sort of how it feels from here. I think. The elections are not about policy, they're about relations with China. Um, and elections are actually not often about policy. <laughs> you know, they, they, they are about um, the economy, but not so much the choices that are on offer about the economy, but the general state of the economy and how it makes people feel, yeah. or about the trust and belief that the governments, that the party will be a competent government. And so quite often, the policy issues sometimes aren't that far apart. Sometimes they are, of course, uh, but that's not necessarily what's driving voting behavior anywhere. Um, and you know, for a long time, and it wasn't the case in 2021, but for a long time, as Jackson will, will, will um, attest to, um, the, the Scotland's place within the United Kingdom was the, the, one of the biggest issues um, in Scottish elections, rather than the policy detail. Um, so it's just to, to respond to the comment that you made there, but yeah, very interesting. Ch China is one of the issues, actually, that does break through in US politics. Um, not for any kind of informed point of view, per se, but uh, Trump's politics in particular, and I think populist uh, or nationalist campaigns more generally need a boogeyman. 
uh, to, uh, and for China, and, for, and relative to the US election, Trump has not made China the boogeyman. Uh, and he talks about uh, his relationship with President Xi and, and the fact that he could solve a lot of those problems. And on the other side of the coin, it is a relentless um, sort of defense of the idea that China needs to stay in their lane. So th this is the one where, um, and it gets confusing at a sort of a citizen level because a lot of Trump's voters actually remember way back when, four years ago, when he campaigned against China. Uh, and you know, in a really disparaging kind of way. And so the Americans have been raised to believe that China's the enemy, which just makes it, its presence in our election uh, really interesting and a little confusing. But of course it was Nixon who went to China. Uh, only, I mean, only Nixon could go to China, but, but, of course. But, <laughs> but does that mean China, is that so long ago it doesn't have any resonance at all? Or did the fact that America broke the international taboo of relationships with China, something kind of that has left a kind of seed of kind of association in the public mind of kind of America and China? Well, the, 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 the sort of almost quaint idea of Nixon, only Nixon can go to China, really has less to do with China than it does the idea that you could do something extraordinary and maybe unwind, you know, kind of risky. Um, in, the, in the mind of the US voter, um, and really, on a, from a policy perspective as well, I mean, China owns us uh, and is really seen uh, in many ways as the only other actor in, on earth who can challenge the United States for hegemony. So they're, they're, the, they're the bad guys, but don't ask Americans to tell you why. They've just been told they're the bad guys. Okay. We'll come to the gentleman up here, and then we've got two gentlemen over on this side who would like to ask a question as well. Uh, hello, I'm Andy. Uh, it's just kind of a fundamental question on kind of democracy. So democracy is also is rated across Europe and the world in different levels, and in, even in within the UK and with against Scotland and America. Do you think a uh, change of system that would encourage more political parties would be helpful for this? Because I think you'd be able to tackle potentially talking about key policy issues a lot more. We talked about people kind of falling out of terms with their political party that they usually vote for because of policy decisions that they've made, so now they don't know who to vote for. And I think there's going to be a rise in people currently who maybe struggle at every general election to be like, who do I vote for? I know I personally, at this general election, I did vote just to in case you were worried about that. Um, but I did struggle with, like, who should I vote for this time around? Because there's just so much policy. You know, if you take a Venn diagram, no political party is an individual circle. There's crossover everywhere. So do you think more parties would help this problem? Well, see, that, I find that a fascinating question, too, it because uh, it, it plays back to my view that the traditional willingness just to associate with a party because you agree with 40% of what it says and you'll live with the other 60 is not really kind of something people feel comfortable about doing. Uh, and my post bag is full of very bizarre emails now. You know, I can never vote for you again because your party won't ban foie gras. Uh, I, 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 you know, you kind of, you feel I'm not really quite sure how I'm meant to deal with that as a kind of political statement. But, but but then again, more political parties. Well, this parliament was set up. I remember the great claim of Holyrood was this will be different. This will not be a, par a parliament that is governed by party politics. We're going to have a, a rainbow parliament with all the different communities represented, all the business people for whom London's too far away who want to contribute, all the voluntary sector people who will be able to come forward and champion. We've had two independent members in my time, uh, Margot MacDonald and the Labour man who's it named yeah, Dennis Cannavan, um, him. We had one parliament where we had uh, the Scottish Socialist uh, crew. I think it was the 2003, 2003 parliament. But uh, really increasingly, aside from the sort of growth of the Greens, um, this has become every bit as much a party politically driven establishment. And is it almost impossible to create a world of new parties and have them break through on a substantive basis rather than reform, which has broken through on the basis of one figurehead alone? So <clears throat> to go back to your, 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 were you meaning electoral system or broader than that? Yes. Yeah. 
So I, mean, I think that obviously the electoral system will shape the number of parties that you end up having in Parliament. And I, I do think that the UK electoral system is increasingly out of step with the Norman democracies and open to challenge, particularly in light of the election we've just had, when you can have a massive majority with a third of the vote share. I mean, that's extraordinary. So if we were to have another a, a variety of proportional representation systems that may be more or less proportional and may lead to more or less parties. But let's imagine a scenario where we have a system that is like that, that everything becomes much more fragmented. I think what you would end up having is co coalition blocks, um, not just to, to govern, obviously you need that to govern, but even to do anything in Parliament. And maybe um, you might, they, they may not necessarily be fixed permanent blocks, but coalitions of the willing over particular policy issues. Um, I think um, trying to, um, ideology, I suppose, personality, <laughs> um, broader sort of issues about, you know, Europe, democracy itself, independence, these sorts of things might tend to lead people to coalesce anyway. Um, so you might end up with sort of pseudo parties or, or I suppose but a little bit like European Parliament, right? So th that started with different bits and they ended up having European political parties to bring together essentially a sort of disparate group of people to get things done. Yeah, I, so, I, mean, I think I agree briefly. I mean, yeah, much more attracted to changing voting systems. And uh, there are also kind of practical things here, right? It's expensive. You know, it's expensive. Membership of parties is falling across the board. I mean, the SNP published its membership figures. Was it yesterday or the day before? You know, they've lost half their members from sort of the immediate post-independence uh, referendum uh, days. Um, reform, I think, is a bit different anyway. It's just bankrolled. I mean, you know... You could set up a party that's bankrolled by a couple of really rich individuals. Where, well, you know, there's, you know, you could, you, you could you could do a session just on that. You know, on the, the difficulties of that. That that's not really what, what we're looking for. I don't think. You know, we've had. You know, we've got 45 or whatever percent of the population supports independence. A party set up with that uh, with that sole kind of purpose, uh, Alex, by a former first minister, and it's nowhere. Electorally, absolutely nowhere, and nor will it, nor will it be, in my view, in, in, not in the, not in the uh, foreseeable future anyway. Um, there are no signs. So, so, you know, there are a lot of kind of failures of new parties being set up, and I think there are a lot of obstacles for, unless you've got a particular uh, mission and you've got a lot of money to set it up, there are a lot of obstacles to actually achieving it anyway. I, I, I think I agree with Nicola. I'm much more, I'd be much more interested in changing voting systems. I just think new. I think more parties is bad, um, uh, and uh, uh, and the reason why I say that is that I think the art of governing is is essentially compromise, and how can you compromise if you are a single issue, whether you're a single issue voter or a single issue party that's been given the responsibility of representing a bunch of voters who care about one thing. Um, Nothing gets done, at least in, well, nothing gets done by the U.S. Congress, full stop. But uh, nothing gets done without compromise. And I think part of the reason why nothing's getting done is because this, this fragmentation or balkanization and the center of the party kind of on both sides moves to the extreme, just have a conversation with each other. You know, they, there's a sort of saying, if um, the best solution is one in which neither party is really happy, uh, because you've had to give up a little bit of what you care about in the art of reaching some sort of a solution. And I think uh, you know, you look, uh, countries that have multiple, multiple, multiple parties are always having elections. And I, I, all, I mean, how many elections has Italy had in my lifetime? Uh, it's, you don't get things done without compromising, and I think, I think multi-party systems discourage that. Okay. I'm going to get two last questions together just here. Uh, so from this gentleman first. Okay, thank you. My name's Mike, and I was involved with my first electioneering in the early 1960s. I think you must have been a baby in arms there. Okay. But one of the things I've noticed is that certainly when I was first involved in electioneering, the way we found out about electoral issues was by the newspapers. Then we began to see the television, but the, the 
leader of a party was much, much less significant. And when you've identified in your discussions about the kind of quasi-presidential role, I do wonder to what extent has that been affected by the media and the world that we live in, rather than by the political change. And that made me reflect on what was brought home to me for this last election in the UK, where the amount of activity that took place online was totally out of my perceptions at all. I was used to using leaflets and knocking on doors and that sort of thing. Um, and is that going to be such a significant change that it's going to be a real game changer in the way that politics is organised in democracies in the future? And the gentleman in front. Um, after Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela um, like basically stole the second election, um, what does this mean for Venezuelan democracy? Is there any more hope left there? And then the impact on South American democracy wider? Well, not quite related, but uh, two good questions. So this will be the last round of questions we have. So anybody like to kick off with this one? Jason. Well, you're the you'll do, well, you'll do the first one, he can do the second, all right. She's your president. I'm less worried about the role of leaders and having such a high profile, and I'm looking at you guys at the front here, than I am the role of influencers. Um, now, I don't know. That I, I know from my own teenagers the amount of information they derive from TikTok, um, and I find that deeply concerning. Um, it's not all bad, I know that, and, and a lot of it's funny. But there are these people that seem to earn an extraordinary amount of money to just talk <laughs> and, and can be very influential. Um, and I, I don't know how well-informed any of that is. But it ca it, so if, that, if we move in the direction of that becoming more and more significant um, to the point that it shapes... Um, political behaviour. I don't know if there's much evidence of it shaping it now, uh, Mark. Um, but that, so that worries me a little bit more because we, there's, it's less transparent in, well, for, certainly for old. I'm getting old. I'm just getting old. I think that's a problem. So. <laughs> and Jason? I am also getting old. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, I don't think this is an if question. It's a how now then question, because I think it's already there. Um, there were, I mean, there will always be leaflets. I have people who make a living sending mailers during elections, but the vast majority of people are getting their information online and are engaged online, and that is not going away. That's only becoming up. So we're already there. In terms, in terms of Maduro, um, just look to Colombia. I, I don't think hope is lost. It, it's a terrible situation. There is no such thing as a... I mean, it's, you know, de democracy is to Venezuela as democracy is to Russia, right? There's no real democracy there. But uh, I, I don't give up hope that that situation would eventually change. Um, pressure from, you know, sort of uh, neighbors on the continent, pressure from international organizations um, over time, yeah? Um, but not anytime soon, yeah? And Mark, yeah, are you going to find a reflection? I, I mean, think on the first question, yeah, when we were definitely on this that terrible word, like a, a sort of a journey from sort of traditional media to, uh, to kind of new media, one of the important things I think to look at here is part, uh, how parties spend their money, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're all over this, right? They know, I mean, some of the really sophisticated sort of monitoring techniques and systems that parties have in place, you know, the value of the pounds that they, you know, the money that they spend. And there's a huge shift. I mean, there's a huge shif shift to social media. Uh, you see it here, you see it, uh, you see it in the States. And that's not just because it's trendy or whatever. That's because they know that that has more impact, right? Uh, yeah, as a consumer, I still get, I still got, I don't know about you, I've got quite a few leaflets through. They were actually all from the same party. I didn't get, I didn't get leaflets from different parties this time, which I think I might, might have done that's just previously. That's just good targeting. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> um, so that's kind of an, an anecdotally. But how many did you read? <laughs> I didn't read any. I don't think you read any of them. But, uh, the professional hazard. <laughs> but well, I, I do think, think but the, yeah, I, but, and, and I agree, with, I mean, we've, we've sort of got children of, sort of similar, age, similar ages, sort of minor late teenagers, and yeah, they're, um, it is, it, it, you know, it is quite something to see what they're, to see what they're consuming and the kind of regulation or lack of regulation of that and, and the, the absolute ability to be able to 
pump this stuff out without any kind of recourse to the sort of veracity of it, I think is, is, is I know that's a whole other subject, which I know you've been talking about. Well, but, but, <laughs> um, but it, yeah, I, I, I worry about that deeply. I think. Although, I mean, I have to say, like television news, there's more of it, but it says less. And I kind of feel that with election leaflets, it, it, they're all different shapes and sizes, but they only say the same thing. A session, not in this festival, is with the editor of The Sun in, in Scotland who was reflecting on, they came out for Labour, as The Sun corporately did or UK did, but talking about the difference between the sort of the anticipation of that moment in 2024 to 1997. The right? endorsement. Yeah, the endorsement. Yeah. 1997, you know, for those of us old enough to remember that kind of campaign, we were sort of sitting with bated breath, waiting... Mm -hmm waiting to see what the sun would do I mean for good or ill uh, I mean this time we weren't really and she did a she did a marvelous job of kind of building up the kind of the looking back on that anticipation but the, the, the fact is it just didn't have the same impact and that is a and that is a single comparison of the same event it tells you everything I think that you need but, to know but the sun in 1997 had four million view, uh, readers yeah. Yeah. Uh, today it is valued at less than one pound yeah. as a commodity yeah. and most people think when Rupert Murdoch dies, the sun will close within a week because it, it's not worth anything as a, as a business. Don't get you back to jail, <laughs> um, that's where we have to end. I hope, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, can I just advertise something that's coming up shortly because I was kind of partly responsible for bringing it to the Parliament and that's a performance by Scottish Opera um, and this is a, a, a modern 15-minute opera called In Flagrante. It's taking place in the, in the garden lobby and it is three government ministers waking up the morning after the night before at a party conference um, with a spin doctor trying to explain how they're going to have to deal with the consequences of their actions. It only lasts about 15 minutes and it's very entertaining. And after that, we have um, a final uh, really excellent event, which will be a debate about... Um, the whole kind of history of uh, the Scottish Parliament and responsible debate, and that's taking place at 3.15. Uh, there's a survey that'll come out. I hope you will all uh, complete it and, uh, and say what you thought of today's session. But can I thank, first of all, our, our interpreters, uh, VSL interpreters, who've been <laughs> popping up and down throughout. Can I thank all of you for your participation and attendance? And can I ask you to thank our three panellists again, Professor Nicola McEwen, Mark Diffley and Jason Box. Thank you all very much. <laughs>